So let me take you back to June 2015. I had just finished my first year of university, and for the months leading up to the summer vacations, I'd applied to 197 summer internships. I got rejected from every single one. So a little downhearted, I flew back to my hometown in Spain, where I grew up, to spend the summer holidays. But within a few days, I found myself still really eager to gain some kind of business experience that could complement my degree in management. But I had to make my own experience. So together with a few friends, we identify a gap in the local nightlife market. All of the bars in the area are providing the same products at the same prices, with the same music, and at the same type of venue. So within two weeks, we've started a nightlife business, and we open our first seasonal bar called Dangalanga. It's named after an Argentine comedian who had passed away just a couple of years ago. And it looked a little bit like this. So you have the main entrance, an alfresco courtyard, and then the interior of the bar itself. And just so that you can gauge the size of the place, here's Kanye West standing at 1 meter 73. <laughs> now, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. We were just a bunch of teenagers with not a lot of money and virtually no experience between us. Here's a message from one of my co-founders the day before our opening night. He said, bro, just realized we don't have electricity. So I replied very calmly. What? <laughs> yeah, we should probably sort that out. Also, who has the keys? This guy had two jobs. So, today I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the simple approaches we took to making this experimental, entrepreneurial project successful, despite lacking so many resources. So first of all, we originated as five co-founders. But together, we soon found out that the money that we had bunched together just wasn't going to be enough to cover all of the costs of starting this business. You know, there's legal fees, there's the advance on the rent, there's the first week of inventory, and all these different things that we just didn't factor into account. So we decided to recruit three more co-founders, and we gave ourselves 48 hours to do this. So we knew that our very first customers would be our immediate circles of friends, and that under the assumption that they still like us after a few weeks, they still keep on coming back and bring their friends. Then over time, those friends of friends start bringing their friends, and so the network of customers grows almost exponentially until you reach a certain level of saturation, where everybody comes to the bar because everyone else they know is at the bar. And this is part of what is called the network effect. It's one of the reasons why Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, for instance, are so incredibly popular today and so difficult to compete with. So, sure, we identified some people who could bring those large immediate clusters together. But then what about the groups who are so detached from our established social networks? Well, the answer was simple. We also identified people who could bridge those gaps. So we ended up with a team of eight co-founders. So this is what a typical corporate hierarchy might look like. You have the board of directors at the top, followed by the CEO, followed by senior management, and so on, until you get to the entry-level employees at the bottom. But we were all equally as unqualified, so we made everything equal. We all had the same equity, we all had the same decision-making power, and therefore we all had the same interest in making this work. Now, Taking into account business continuity, which is one thing we did think about, going into the next summer, people, of course, could leave the team. And how we would sort this out would be we'd just replace them with new people who could bring in fresh networks and fresh ideas, updating the kind of business model that we wanted to create. Here's a great quote by Ed Catmull, who co-founded Pixar together with Steve Jobs. He says, if you give a good idea to a mediocre team, they will mess it up. If you give a mediocre idea to a brilliant team, they will either fix it or throw it away and come up with something better. Getting the team right is the necessary precursor to getting the idea right. 
and pushing it towards success. So, now that we have this early expansive network, which, did it work? Yes, it did. Our opening night, we saw hundreds of people, we were at full capacity, and we sold out of all of our inventory, which was supposed to last a week at least. So this continued several nights a week for the remainder of the summer, for three months. But what about those more quiet nights? How do we capitalize on those? So the obvious answer is advertising, to reach new people. Now, we didn't have an advertising budget because we had no money. So we, that forced us to think of free alternatives, and we went for the, these, Yik Yak, WhatsApp, and Snapchat. Now, this allowed us to contact customers directly, you know, instantly to their phone, in their pocket. Engagement rates were bound to be very high because of the personal nature of these channels. Also, it allowed us to funnel people towards certain events, which in turn became more lively, which in turn people enjoyed more and were more likely to come back um, to future events that we hosted. Now, all of these platforms, we tried to communicate messages that were as relevant as possible to our customers. We didn't want to spam them with dozens of messages a day about all kinds of deals or anything, so we limited it to one or two messages a week um, to make the message itself more powerful. Now, this relevance cannot be said about customers who replied to these messages. One guy started sending me facts about cats every single day for the rest of the summer. For those of you who don't know, the first cat launched into space was in 1963. <laughs> I secretly loved it. But uh, you know, th this emphasizes the risk associated with these kind of two-way platforms, especially when you're using them in a consumer-to-consumer -cu nature. Next up was pricing. Now, we ourselves were students, so we knew what it was like to be on a budget. So we didn't want other people who were very price sensitive to have to compromise and go elsewhere because of the cost of their night out. So we undercut all competitors' prices by at least 10% on all products. Now, this meant that our profit per unit sold went down a little bit, but at the end of the day, you have more people coming through the door attracted by this kind of pricing, making more purchases, and so your profit ends up actually going higher. Next up was ambience, something absolutely critical to a business that relies on the venue itself. So we thought about a lot of different ideas, and here's some examples. So firstly, we realized pretty early on that our customers in smaller groups of two to four people were coming earlier in the nights than larger groups. So what we did was we positioned our smaller tables nearer to the entrance so that passers-by on the street would be able to see that there are more people in the bar and therefore be more likely to enter the bar rather than go to a competing bar which looked busier. Another thing we did was music. Surprisingly, all of our competitors in the areas played the same kind of music, both inside and outside their bar. So we switched it up a little bit. We made themed events, specific nights, we have different genres of music, both inside and outside in the courtyard. Something else we did was change up the lighting. So the entire outside courtyard was lit up by candles and fairy lights. Millennials love fairy lights. <laughs> and then another thing, the reason there's a dinosaur there is I go to work on a Tuesday evening I walk through the entrance, and there's about a dozen people dressed as dinosaurs. Did I miss a meeting? I don't know what's going on, but it turns out that people, our customers, started organizing de facto themed parties at our venue. It was the only place they felt comfortable doing that kind of thing. Not only because of the layout, but also because of the kind of environment that our staff generated. So our staff did all kinds of games with uh, with our customers. They made it very playful. Uh, one example is we had a small basket at one end of the bar and then a mini basketball at the other end. And every now and then, a staff member would challenge someone to throw the basketball into the basket, maybe 10, 15 meters. No one ever got it, but it was still created this kind of playful environment that people actually really enjoyed and that really differentiated us from everybody else. 
So this whole experimental project, it was successful because we just started asking the right questions and the tough questions. And then that gave way to building a team that built the foundation of everything else that we did, all of the ideas and how those ideas were executed. The networks they br brought compounded things such as advertising, pricing, and ambience. So we managed to achieve customer satisfaction, which was our ultimate goal, while staying surprisingly financially afloat, despite being so incredibly disorganized in the beginning. So what were the results? So apart from the eight co-founders, we employed three people. Now, considering that unemployment in Spain at the time was 22% over that summer, we believe that no matter how small, we still did our part in trying to help out the situation there. One of those employees was a bouncer. He was in charge of security. He was absolutely brilliant. We had zero security incidents. We served thousands of customers a month, and at the end of the summer, we did generate a profit with a 39% return on investment. Now, this experiment was successful for a few different reasons, but one absolutely critical factor is consistent, direct, constructive feedback between everybody in the team. If someone had a terrible idea and they couldn't justify it, they were told it was a terrible idea. And likewise, if someone had a great idea, they were told it's a great idea. And so there was this constant feedback that allowed people to get really passionate about the kinds of projects they wanted to create or the kind of events they wanted to host. And that made those events and projects so successful. And what was incredibly interesting about this is we started off thinking that we didn't have any resources. We had no experience, no money, no networks. But to start a project like this, if you just take the plunge with a bit of initiative and common sense, you actually find out that you're far better equipped than you think you are. Thank you very much.